Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. One of the big working theses that I'm operating under as I pursue this project is that it was the confluence of the rise of social media and the invention of the smartphone that really mainstreamed computing, that created a world where your grandmother checks the computer in her pocket six times a day to see what people have posted on Facebook. So going forward, I'm hoping to eventually chip away at all the various technologies and components that came together to make the smartphone possible. Things like GPS, battery technology, touchscreen technology, that sort of thing. And so very much in that vein, I was super excited to get a chance to speak with Stephen Sasson, the inventor of the world's first digital camera. Because, I mean, it's hard to imagine modern life without digital photography. And because of that, it's maybe easy to forget what a marvel digital photography really is. And Steve Sasson has been front and center for the entire digital photography revolution. In this episode, he recounts for us the sort of skunkworks project that led to the first digital camera. He discusses the long gestation that the technology had within the company that developed it, Kodak. And towards the end of the episode, we get into a fascinating examination of that company, of Kodak, and the very nature of technology disruption, for which Kodak is often held up as a poster child for the innovation struggles in the digital era. I really have to say this is one of the most fascinating episodes we've ever done, so I'm thrilled to give you this conversation with Stephen Sasson. Stephen Sasson, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Oh, thanks for inviting me, Brian. Uh, Is it true? Are you a Brooklyn native? Yes, I am. I I grew up in in Bay uh, Bay Ridge section of Brooklyn. Oh, I'm coming to you from uh, Dumbo right now today, so uh, about two miles oh, away. Cool. Um, yeah, very cool. You got, a, you got a bachelor's and a master's in electrical engineering from RPI, so I, I'm, I'm guessing that you sort of always had an interest in, in gadgets and tinkering and that sort of thing? Yeah, I sure did. Uh, you know, we just spoke about Brooklyn, and one of the great things about growing up in Brooklyn is that uh, people, uh, a very high concentration of people, and they used to throw out their electronics, their old TVs and radios, and I used to go around the neighborhood and pick them up and bring them back home and, and basically dissect them uh, for their parts to do for my projects, my electronic projects. And uh, uh, so uh, that's where my interest was and, 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 and was fostered uh, during my early years as a teenager. Uh, you'll be happy to know that's still a tradition today. Before we take it to the trash, we leave it on the stoop, and, and more often than not, it disappears no matter what it is. Um, oh, absolutely, yeah. So... Uh, after is is your first job out of college with Kodak? Did you were you recruited by Kodak? How how did you end up there? Well, I I, yeah, I interviewed at a number of firms, um, and, and this was in the and this was in the early 1970s. I was interviewing in 1973, uh, and uh, you know a lot of the the space race uh, and and the thing for the moon was sort of dying down. And and so uh, I was looking for a company that had a little bit more stability to it. And when I interviewed at Kodak, um, I found it to be a very interesting company because they had uh, a very wide set of interests. Uh, they were interested in imaging, but all kinds of imaging. And uh, so I I was really intrigued by that company. So that's why of the companies I interviewed, uh, that's the one I chose. 
Yeah, we should we should say that you know at, at this point Kodak is one of the bluest of the blue chips, you know, a, a member of of the Dow uh, index and things like that. So it really is, you're 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 going to one of the the technology leaders of the day. Oh, absolutely! It was one of the biggest companies around, uh, very well regarded, uh, and they had consumer, they had professional, they had health related stuff, they had science, science, they had military related activities. They were they were a very interesting company to go for, and they were very very well known at the time, and had and it had been so for over almost a hundred years, so uh, it was well established. So, as a, a young twenty four year old college graduate, um, you you're hired by Kodak. Do they hire you for a specific task, or is it more um, you're a smart guy? We're going to find something for him to do. Well, they were they they hired me. I interviewed in a number of areas of the company. That's why I mentioned how diverse the company was, because I interviewed in a number of different areas where they uh, did different types of work. And the one that I was hired into was uh, really a, an applied research laboratory uh, in what was, what was called at that time the Kodak Apparatus Division. And it really what had to do with, as the name implies, building all of the apparatus or equipment that uses the photographic materials that were manufactured at Kodak Park, which is another part of the company. Uh, so they made the cameras, they made the printers, they made projectors and things like that. Uh, and I, this, in, this research laboratory that I interviewed and was accepted into uh, was, uh, was a really interesting place. They had, they had uh, groups of people working in different uh, expertise areas area of physics. They had a ma mathematical group. They had a mechanics group, an electronics group. Uh, and so uh, when I interviewed there, uh, at the end of my interview process, they asked me which, which of the areas I seemed to like the best. And I said, I, I mentioned that area uh, just because it seemed so diverse and interesting. You know, they're working on all kinds of stuff. And that indeed was the area that I was hired into. And your, uh, your supervisor at the time was a, a man by the name of uh, Gareth Lloyd, I believe? Yes, that's right. Gareth Lloyd was the supervisor of the electronics group, and he was my immediate supervisor uh, at that time. Uh, and I was hired in uh, to work for him in his group. His group probably had, uh, I'm trying to remember now, maybe 15 people in it or something like that. So please correct me if this is a, a oversimplification, but um, the way I read it is, is that uh, one day he sort of... Uh, Gareth gives you a sort of a broad assignment. He sort of uh, throws some uh, st solid state imagers at you and, and says, uh, is there anything we can do with these? Is that, is that somewhat close to the truth? Yeah. Well, what happened was because this laboratory was engaged in so many activities, uh, they were activities related to product development. Uh, they were activities rel related to solving product ideas, uh, different concepts. Uh, so it wasn't unusual for uh, an engineer, even a beginning engineer, to have several projects. Uh, and uh, I had just completed a project uh, having to do with designing the electronics behind uh, a lens cleaning machine, a machine that automatically cleans the lenses on a production line. Mm. And uh, so I had, I had just finished that project, and he, and he came into me one day, and the whole conversation I'm about to relate to you really took probably less than 15 to 30 seconds. <laughs> I remember, I remember this because I remember I was sitting at my desk and he came in and was standing beside me, leaning against my file cabinet, and he said, well, I've got two sort of filler projects for you. These are relatively small projects to keep me busy until something more useful came along. One was to do uh, exposure control modeling for XL movie cameras. That was, that was the mathematical modeling for how exposure controls would work on a movie camera. Uh, and then the other one was to look at a, a, a new type of, of imaging device called the charge coupled device. And I said, would you like to look at that? And I, I immediately jumped at this, the charge coupled device one. And the reason I did was because when I did my master's work at RPI, I had looked at, I became fascinated how, uh, by how light affected silicon. I, I just love the idea of having light somehow control something. And I, 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 I designed and built a, uh, an optically controlled uh, thyristor converter. It's a mouthful, but basically it was light pulses controlling how electrical, electrical energy flowed in the, in the uh, uh, portions of a generator. And so I had become sort of interested in how light affected silicon. So he offered me this. I jumped right on it because I was just fascinated by that kind of stuff. And so we really didn't have any goals. Uh, it was simply, well, 
get one and play with it and see if there's anything useful we can do with this thing. And in a sense, he was a very, very broad assignment. It, 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 I mean, it, we, we talked about capturing images. We talked about measuring devices, something to use for measuring a metrology on a manufacturing line. You know, nobody had played with this before. It, they had just commercially become available. And, and he just asked me to get one and play with it. Yeah, I just... Um... In, in, a, in a general way, could you describe what a, what a charge coupled device is? Yeah, a charge coupled device was was a, a, an invention actually that took place at Bell Labs in like the 1969 by two fellows named Boyle and Smith. And what they had done, they had discovered that uh, if you could take a charge pattern or a charge packet, for example, just a little group of, of electrons, you could move them from point to point across a two-dimensional surface without losing any of the electrons. In other words, to maintain the integrity of that packet of electrons. And you could move it through many, many iterations, hundreds, thousands of iterations, and you could just keep that charge packet intact. And that was an interesting concept because what they, what they, what they produced was uh, a, a, a piece of silicon that you would shine light on, uh, and maybe take an exposure on, and it would generate a corresponding uh, elect electron uh, pattern that, that corresponded to the light pattern. And then uh, you could use this charge coupling mechanism, which they developed, to move it off the, 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 the uh, chip and maintain the integrity of that charge pattern and uh, obviously maintain the, uh, uh, the integrity of the optical pattern that was resident on that surface. So uh, it, was a, it was an interesting concept. Um, uh, it was used in a couple of linear devices. That is just a line of photodiodes at that time. Mm -hmm. But a, a company called Fairchild uh, decided to make a two-dimensional matrix. It was 100 pixels by 100 pixels, a little square like that. And using the charge coupling process, uh, you could shine a light pattern on it. And after a period of time, you could start clocking uh, these uh, electronic clocks out of it. Uh, using the charge coupling mechanism, and you would, you would read out in order the corresponding charge pattern that related to that optical pattern. And so that, that's really what it was. Uh, it, it really didn't have much application at the time. Uh, people were certainly thinking about it in terms of imaging, but it was pretty pretty uh, early stages. So this this CCD doesn't necessarily have obvious application yet, but you you're essentially interested in doing something with it. So am I am I right in in guessing that you stumbled on a camera as just a way you didn't set out to make a camera you just th stumbled on that as a way to maybe get some application out of this device? Well, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you my line of reasoning at sure. the time when I got the when I got the assignment uh, since that was basically the, the only direction I had. I thought, well, if I'm going to study this thing, uh, it would be really helpful to measure the charge pattern that comes out and see how that corresponded to the light pattern, right? And so I said, well, if I want to do that, I better capture the charge pattern. Remember, the charge pattern came out in little pulses of voltage mm -hmm. that represented each little pixel that was resident on that 100 by 1. So there'd be 10,000 little charge pulses that came out. And, and so I said, I have, I'd be able to store that, and that way I'd be able to measure them. But then when I was thinking about it, I said, well, I'm going to store them you know, how am I measuring would be nice? It'd be nice to be able to see that pattern. Uh, just like the charge couple device itself saw the light pattern, I'd like to create a corresponding light pattern on some sort of an output device, and that would allow me to see what the CCD was sort of seeing. And so that became fairly obvious to me that I was thinking about something that was an analog to a film camera. Uh, it was ca a film camera that uses film to capture an image, and then you can look at it later on after it's developed and printed. And so I said, okay, I'm, I'm going to try to build an electronic still camera. And um, then I decided I would go completely digital. And, 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 I'll, and I'll mention to you, you know, it has a lot to do with your experience. I mentioned to you earlier that, that I had done this um, lens cleaning machine mm -hmm. uh, as, as an assignment right before this. Well, during that lens cleaning machine, that was a completely digital approach I took with what was, what was then called small scale integration logic. It was logic made up of individual AND and OR gates uh, using logic families like uh, TTL or CMOS mm -hmm. technologies. Mm -hmm. And, and this, this um, uh, it, it sort of predisposed me to do this digitally. If I could capture this, these pulses digitally, I could store them indefinitely because I could store them digitally, right? 
Um, and because I knew about this SSI logic that I had just learned about, I thought I'd use that as a way to, uh, to capture these charge patterns. And so here I was, I was thinking about building a device that would capture uh, an optical pattern that was turned into a charge pattern that would be turned into numbers, digitized, and then I would store them on some digital storage mechanism. And that would be, that would mean you know, a device. I called it an electronic still camera. Uh, and then when I was thinking about actually building it, I, I have to take you back to the time period. Sure. Since this was a camera, most cameras, all cameras in the world were really mechanical marvels at the time. They were, they were very intricate mechanical uh, devices that precisely controlled with a shutter the amount of light that would fall on a piece of film to get the right exposure. Uh, mechanical advanced features for moving ahead physically the film from one frame to the next frame, uh, and and uh, obviously the optical components necessary. To do it. It, they were mechanical marvels. And I really didn't have much experience in mechanical design at all. I was a pure electronics guy. I loved electronics. And so one of the other things I thought I would try to do, and this was me just being me, I guess, I try to say, if I'm going to build an electronic still camera, I'm going to have a camera with absolutely no moving parts. I thought that was really cool. Right. Uh, I, I didn't know how, exactly how to do this, but I thought if I could do that, it sort of demonstrated the idea of an electronic still camera. There's no moving parts to this camera. And that would separate it from any mechanical camera in existence. Uh, and so that was sort of in my mind uh, when I went through this process of figuring out what I was going to try to do. Well, let's let's get into some of the details of, of the the camera that you do piece together because you're you're essentially using parts that are existent in, in the lab that you're working in, right? Yeah, you know that's one of the things that uh, I try to emphasize with people. Uh, this project uh, was really a very small project. Hard, nobody was paying attention to me at all here. Um, the I had no budget. I, I was allowed to go out and buy one of these CCDs, which, I, as I remember, cost several hundred dollars at the time, which back in 1974 or so was a considerable amount of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and and that's about it. I mean, I would I was allowed to use whatever was around in the laboratory. Now, this was a great laboratory. It had a lot of parts. Um, but uh, I basically, uh, uh, no one asked me to build a camera, and nobody was going to pay for me to build a camera. Uh, if I, whatever I could find around to do this thing, whatever I was going to do, uh, I had to find in, in that, from the parts that were around my, my environment. So, for example, uh, you you grab a lens from a, a Super 8 movie camera, right? Yeah, yeah. That was that was the great thing about working at Kodak. We, we had all this technology uh, that was around. Our laboratory was located in Building Four of the Apparatus Division, uh, on the on the second floor. And these were two-floor buildings. On the first floor was the assembly line for the XL movie cameras. And so, when I was thinking about that, I looked at the optical uh, area that rep was rep represented by the CCD, and it was uh, smaller than that of the optical area of one frame of Super 8 movie uh, film. And so, I thought, well. It, I could get the optics. I don't have to do any optical design. Not that I could do optical design and not that anybody would pay for any optical fabrication. But I thought if I could find something that already existed that I could use, that would work. And so I went downstairs to the XL movie camera and, and line and I took out of their used parts bin uh, an old uh, discarded uh, eight millimeter uh, Super 8 movie camera. And I brought that up there and the optical assembly and the viewfinder assembly from that I took it apart and I used that, and then I mounted the CCD when it came in inside that uh, inside it. That was my optical assembly. Well, and you mentioned uh, earlier that y you need something to store the the digital image or the digital data, actually, and so you just turn to your average uh, digital cassette, sort of uh, as people might remember from use in Walkmans and things like that. Well, yeah, it was. It was, there were several problems uh, that I had to go uh, to solve in order to get to that point. Mm. I had to first, I had to take those little, first I had to get the CCD to work. And I like to tell this story because it's true. Sure. These devices were very experimental. And uh, when it came, uh, the device was a, what was 20, called a 24-pin dip package, dual inline package. So it was a little integrated circuit. 
uh, and with a with a quartz top, and you could see the surface underneath it. And when you opened up the plastic box it came in, it was sunk in some uh, plastic, uh, some some uh, conductive foam. That's how they shipped them back then. And on top of it was folded a piece of paper. And on, and when you opened it up, there were twelve pre-printed voltage designations. These were the separate voltages that had to be supplied to the different pins on the device. Uh, in order to make it work. There were, there were several sets of clocks and several sets of bias voltages that had to be put on there. And then next to each one, written in pencil, was uh, handwritten, was the actual voltage that this particular device that was in this particular box uh, worked, on, worked at when it left the production line. And then at the bottom, it said, good luck. Okay. <laughs> and the reason you needed that was because, think about how this device worked. You, you had to apply a light pattern to it and then apply all of these complex voltages and clocking system to it. And all you got out was one single voltage pulse uh, per pixel. And if you didn't get anything out, it was up to you to figure out which one of those 12 individual voltage adjustments was not right. And so uh, it was a very difficult device to work with. Uh, and so I had to spend a lot of time uh, coming up with a system that would generate all these clocking signals uh, and then uh, be adjustable to the point where it would work. And then the next step is I had to turn those voltage pulses into numbers. I had to digitize them. They were coming out relatively fast. Uh, my exposure time was about 50 milliseconds, which meant that each pixel came out every at about a 200 kilohertz rate or so, as I remember. And so I had to turn every every. Uh, uh, several microseconds, I had to turn uh, a particular pulse into a number. And so you need an A to D converter for that. The problem is fast A to D converters back then were very expensive. And of course, as I mentioned before, I had no money to buy anything. But luckily, and here's where you know luck comes into play in all these things. Uh, I was at a time in technology development where uh, digital voltmeters were just starting to come out. That is, instead of having an analog meter where you would measure a voltage on a, a voltage meter, there would be a digital number that would show up. Mm. And the people who were developing that developed a chipset that would turn those voltages into numbers. So there was a type of uh, analog to digital converter called the successive approximation technique. And it only required uh, two little chips that I could buy for like five bucks or something. It was really cheap. And so uh, I used that approach to turn my analog pulses into numbers. Then I had to buy DRAM, uh, which was available at that, at that time. Uh, they, were, they were very expensive. And the highest density DRAM I could get were 4,000 bits mm. per chip. Mm -hmm. uh, so nothing compared to today, of course. But back then, that was a big deal. And then uh, so the idea was I would do an exposure on the CCD read it out very quickly, turn it into numbers very quickly, and store it very quickly in these DRAM. And then from the DRAM, I would read it off the DRAM much more slowly to a more permanent form of storage. And that permanent form of storage was the digital cassette that you referenced before. Mm. Uh, and so this was the basis, uh, the basic architecture of the camera I developed, which turned out to be the basic architecture of all digital cameras today. In fact, was the basis of the patent that we applied for and received in 1978. And so I was sort of driven by the physics of the situation and the nature of digital technology to come up with this architecture that would allow me to build, uh, a, you know, a, an electronic still camera. Uh, I didn't call it a digital camera back then. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is that it didn't help me at all. People didn't trust digital technology back then. And then, and so it didn't make uh, projecting this any easier. So I called it just an electronic still camera. That made the concept more easy. But it was a totally digital device. Right. And so initially you're just, you're just sort of, uh, you know, testing the numbers to see if it works. When, when do you decide to hook it up to a TV to actually see how the images could, could be rendered? Yeah, oh, that was the challenge. You know, we we didn't nothing existed to help us with this, uh, so we had to build. Because we should say this, this is this is before personal computers, yeah, uh, microcomputers right. even exist. So, um, right. a TV would be the the only logical tool I would think to to display. That was the only thing I could think of. There was no way I could even make a print of this at the time. So I thought if I if I could do sort of the opposite of what the camera did, now I've got my 
I, my, my image stored as a bunch of bits on a tape, could I build a device that would do the opposite, read the bits off the tape, and then reassemble them into a picture and then make it compatible with a television and create a television signal and then connect it to an ordinary television set? Because we had television sets in the research laboratory there. So, so uh, we, we, we took a, what well, microprocessor chips were available and they had a development system that was being marketed by Motorola to help engineers develop applications using microprocessor chips. Well, we took that system and I turned it into what we call the playback unit. That is, we built custom boards that would do all of the stuff I just mentioned and create a television signal so I could view it. So I had to do two things. I had to build the camera and I had to build this playback unit. And that took us about a year. And during that year, you never saw anything. The only thing we ever saw in terms of progress was uh, voltage uh, traces on oscilloscopes and, or voltage meeting, re readings on, on digital voltmeters. We never saw anything until everything was put together. Mm. Uh, there was no way, to, no way to sort of halfway through just sort of see if an image was coming out. You could only electronically measure if pulses were coming out. So do you remember the, the first image that you actually tried to view on, on the TV? Yeah, I, I do. It was, um, it was quite, a, quite a day. It was in December. We've been working on it about a year. It was in December of 1975. And I, and I should mention that I was working on this with, uh, with a fellow named Jim Schickler. He was a, a technician that was working with me, but he was way more than just a guy putting stuff together. He was a really smart fellow, and he was learning along with me uh, all of this stuff because nobody had ever done this before. So we were learning together and we were working in the lab shoulder to shoulder uh, all this time. And then um, finally, one day we thought we had done the last test pattern on the playback unit. And then we thought, well, we have to try this. And uh, so Jim looked it at me and I looked at him and we were working in a back laboratory that was about the most unphotogenic place you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. So I picked up the camera uh, that was portable, weighed about eight and a half pounds, about the size of a small toaster. And I walked down the hallway and I found a young lady, one of the lab technicians working in one of the other the physics group, as I remember. Her name was Joy Marshall at the time. And she was sitting at a teletype and she knew us as the guys in the back lab doing this weird stuff. And we, I asked if I could take a head and shoulder shot of her. And um, she said, okay. And so I, I put the... Uh, uh, pressed the button on the camera, and I knew I captured an image because the tape would start to move. That's how I knew I captured an image. And so the tape started to move, so I said thank you, and I walked back to the laboratory. And then when the tape stopped, it took about 23 seconds to record this to my tape. Uh, I popped the tape out and I put it back in our playback unit, and the playback unit would read it in, and took about 23 seconds to read it in, as I remember. Then it took about eight seconds, because I had to create more lines. I had to do interpolation, which is a whole nother story. Uh, and then, uh, then up popped the picture. And what we saw was quite remarkable. We, we saw, um, we saw her, her hair. She had black shoulder length hair. We saw her hair. We saw the white background and, and her face shape was there, but it was completely distorted. You couldn't recognize her at all. It was complete static. Now, Jim and I were looking at this and we were, we were very happy with what we saw because we, we, we knew of a thousand reasons why you might not see anything at all. And to see this much was incredible. And I distinctly remember telling Jim, as we said there, so much is working, so much is working. This is fantastic. And Jim said the same thing. We were just overjoyed. Well, Joy had followed us back to the laboratory and was standing in the doorway, looking at the TV set. We hadn't, no, we turned around, we saw her. She looked at us and she said, it needs work. Turned around and left. Right. And, uh, and what had happened was, you know, it took us a couple of hours to figure this out, but what had happened is when I designed the playback unit, you know, when you have a digital word and you, and, and you, and you serialize it, that is you put one bit at a time on a piece of tape, mm -hmm. uh, you, you take a group of those bits off and then you assemble them into what we call a word, right? In this case, we called it a nibble because it was only four bits per each pixel. Uh, but I, I somehow in my mind mixed up the order in which I put them on when I recorded them in the camera. So I, I reversed the order of the bits. So if you, if you, if you know that if they're all ones, and if that represents the, the whitest uh, part of the scene, or all zeros, which represents the blackest part of the scene, 
that would be okay, independent of the order. So that's why we could see her black hair and the white background. But anything that was in between, that is in the gray area, was mixed up and misinterpreted. Uh, and so that's why her face was complete static. So uh, after a while, we finally figured out the mistake I had made. And uh, we, it was easier to reverse the wires on the, on the unit than it was to do it in software back then. And so I reversed the wires, and then it, her face popped up, and that was the first digital snapshot. And uh, her name was Joy Marshall, you said? Yeah, her name was Joy Marshall yeah, at the yeah. time. She was, uh, she, uh, uh, she it, it's funny, I, I tell this story, and, and uh, 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 Joy had been contacted by different people over mm -hmm. the years, and, and uh, I, I'm sure she <laughs> probably, probably, probably appreciates and maybe doesn't appreciate being the subject of the first first digital photograph but she was and um uh it was a great it was a great moment for for us because here i was standing in the lab and i i must admit i wasn't thinking anything of, of a historical significance i was just thinking all this work and you know dreaming to see if it could work and, and actually to have a face staring back at you from that television screen was was uh, pretty pretty amazing. Uh, uh, you know, one one thing that we haven't discussed. Uh, what is the resolution that you're dealing with at this point? I mean, you know, we talk of megapixels today, but I imagine you weren't dealing anywhere near megapixels <laughs> at that point, right? No, no, we weren't. It was a 100 by 100 array, so that's 10,000 pixels or 0 0.01 megapixels, and and they were black and white. There was no color filter array over them like we're used to today. So it was a black and white image that was made up of 10,000 pixels, 100 pixels on a line, and there were 100 lines. When we displayed it on the television set, we interpolated those 100 lines to 400 lines so that the aspect ratio would look about right. And uh, that's the picture of what we saw. It wasn't great photography at all, and, uh, but it was, it was quite recognizable. You could definitely tell who the people were, and uh, it was sort of like a thumbnail today. Um, uh, but uh, but it was it was uh, it demonstrated the concept, and that was my kind of my idea. At this time, I had sort of become a convert to this. When I started off, I didn't know if it could be done, uh, but when I finally got it working, I this was this made a big impression upon me. And uh, uh, when I uh, showed it to people, uh, you know, I was a real uh, evangel. I was evangelical about this stuff. I, I thought this was so cool. Uh, the fact that you didn't have to use any chemicals, you didn't have to use up any film, you didn't have to load any film. Uh, there were no moving parts, even despite the fact that uh, I had a, a, a cassette player that was moving cassette. But that was really a compromise in my mind. I really did think about building solid state memory modules to put in there, but I didn't have enough money to buy those uh, those uh, memory uh uh, chips, uh, so I, I I went with the uh, with the with the tape player, which by the way I, I found in the back of an old magazine. Mm. It was uh, it was a, the tape the tape mechanism that I used was not for computer work at all. Uh, it was I needed something that would work over 12 volts and fit in my box that I was building for my camera because I wanted it to be portable. And so I found in the back of a magazine uh, this data recorder that was used for field recording of data, such as when you're drilling wells and things like that. Hmm. Anyway, they recorded digital data. It worked off of 12 volts and it would fit in my box. And so I got that and that's what I used to record on. You know, by the way, uh, for listeners in the show notes, I'm going to have a link to a picture of, of this first uh, prototype camera. Um, so you can, you'll, you'll be able to see some of what he's talking about. Um, but so l let's talk about, um, you know, be, becoming evangelical about this. So the, the, the prototype is finished around uh, December of 75. So yes. next year in around 76, you're starting to uh, show your bosses and other people at Kodak what you've done. Um, uh, how did that go? What was the reaction? And, and, and how, how, did you, how did you show it off? Okay, well, I, when we took that first picture, uh, I, I was soon after that, I, I went into my boss's office, Gareth Lloyd, uh, who offered incredible, you know, what an incredible guy he was. He, he supported this really crazy idea, you know, in a world where you have to show results for what you were doing. He had budgets and think deliverables and he allowed me to do this. And he paid, I, he was about the only person I spoke to about this as I was working on it. And I told him about the different pieces that were going together, you know, mm -hmm. and what part of the circuit was working. And when I was finally working, I went to him and I said, Hey, the camera's working. I actually took a picture 
And he says, oh, fantastic. He says, we'll, uh, we'll, bring, we'll bring some people into the lab and show it to them. And I said, no, it's portable. I can, I can take it around and take pictures. So he didn't even know it was a portable device. Uh, you know, it was just, you know, it was just, it was, it was an odd looking thing that folded up and was portable. Mm. So he suggested that we start to show it to people. And now you must understand if you're in a corporation, and I think that this is even true today, what, uh, what happens is if you have a concept you want to show to your boss, you basically go and describe it to him and then you show it to him. And then when he's comfortable with it, he invites his contemporaries and his bosses and then when they get comfortable with the idea, they invite their bosses, you know. And so you go through a series of meetings as you work up the management chain uh, to the point where, uh, you know, either they lose interest or, or whatever. Uh, and so that's what I started doing in January of 1976. I did, in, I did uh, demonstrations of the camera. And how, the, how it worked was simply this. I would, uh, they would set up a meeting in a conference room conference room with a long table down the middle of it, no windows in the conference room. And it was about 60 feet or so from my laboratory. And I would fold up my camera because the camera, if you show them pictures of the camera, they'll see a blue box sitting on top of a bunch of a, of a, of a thing looks right. like an erector set. And, uh, but that all unfolded and it spent most of this time unfolded uh, because that's it was really a working prototype. We, everything was built first time in this device. And then we just fold it up to use it for the one time that you take pictures in a portable mode. So I'd fold it up and I'd walk into the room and whoever was sitting at the front of the, of the room at the right side, right at the front of the table, I would take a snapshot of their head and shoulders, head and shoulders snapshot, much like I did with Joy. And then while the tape was, remember the, the, the picture is captured in 50 milliseconds but it takes 23 seconds to record the resulting image to the tape. Mm -hmm. So for those 23 seconds to cleverly hide that time period, I would describe exactly what I had just done and what this thing was to the to whoever was in the room. Then I would take a second picture uh, of the person sitting on the left side, the same thing. And then I would put the camera down in the middle of the table. When the tape was done, we popped out the tape, uh, my friend Jim Schickler used, uh, rolled in the playback unit with the television monitor mounted on a cart, and we would roll it to the back of the room. I'd hand the tape. He would put it in there, and then about 30 seconds later, up would pop an image, and that was my demonstration. Now, let me uh, tell your audience here that at, at, this was Eastman Kodak, the management chain at Eastman Kodak Company. Eastman Kodak had been in the business for uh, over 100 years of making film and making consumer images. And they were very interested in all kinds of consumer imaging, but this was a little bit different. Here I was taking pictures without using film and displaying them without using paper inside a conference room in Kodak in 1976. There were no consumables whatsoever. I didn't need a photo finishing imaging chain and photo finishers. I didn't need chemicals to develop anything. In fact, all I needed was a few joules of energy out of a battery in order to take pictures. This was an interesting and challenging concept because the whole business model of the photographic industry for the last 100 years was based on the sale of consumables. Chemicals and I paper. I didn't have any. Yeah. Chemicals and paper and things like that. And, and, and I didn't offer any of that. And so subsequently the conversations you know, it's funny, as a, as a young technical person, you, you think if you, after you spend a year sort of building something, you know, you, all these tricks that you use to try to get stuff to work, you, you think people would be interested in that. And that's what I thought they'd ask me about, mm. you know, how I did this. How did I get that to work? They never asked me about that. They never asked me any hows. They asked me why. Why, why, would why any, in terms of why, why would anyone want to do this? <laughs> why, why would anybody want to do this? Why would anybody want to look at their picture on a television set? They were convinced no one would ever want to look at their picture electronically on a television set. What would an electronic photo album look like? Mm. Remember, there's no, no personal computers, right? Well, there's no personal so, computers. There's also no internet. So, you know, the concept right. of emailing a photo to grandmother is not, it's still years away. Right, so right, there's, there's no infrastructure right. for this to be a consumer product, really. Right. There is, there was, you're exactly right. There was no infrastructure. The whole digital world was, didn't exist yet. And so when I was challenged, uh, you know, I made mention before that I didn't call it a digital camera, even though the entire system was digital. This was the first time 
uh, that we had demonstrated a photographic system, a still photographic system that was completely digital and didn't use consumables. And so when they challenged me, they challenged me with a lot of different things, none of which I could really answer because I really never spent a lot of time thinking about some of these things. The idea of a digitally based consumer product, because I, I talked about this being a consumer product someday. And they said, wait a second, a digital, some sort of a digital camera. And I said, what do you mean? There were no digital products back then to reference. Everything today is digital, right? But back yeah. then there were no consumer digital products. There was only, the only reference point I could give were calculators. Calculators were first coming out. Right. And there, there was a calculator by Hewlett Packard called the HP 35. And it was like $400. And so I, I said, I, I had, I brought one to the room. We had to borrow one from our office. You couldn't own one of those things back then. I brought it. And I said, think of this eventually as a calculator with a lens, right? That's how I described it. And then at, for the playback unit, since we didn't have personal computers back then, I referenced right at this time in the trade news, there was a lot of uh, hubbub about uh, uh, jobs in Wozniak were introducing the Apple One computer, that board computer mm -hmm. that they had assembled. And then they called that a computer and you'd, you'd buy power supplies and everything to make it, put it together to go. And I got interested in that the irony was I got interested in that, not because it was a computer, but because Wozniak used exactly the same memory chips that I did. And I never knew anybody else who used these memory chips. And I was so curious that somebody was using them. That's how I found it. And then I, I said, uh, well, this they're talking about something that's sort of like what I've got inside my box. So I said, well, it could be something like this in the future. And I pointed to, to the Apple computer, uh, even though it was very experimental and only hobbyists were interested in it. And so the challenge I got, and I never forget this, one day I got challenged by, by one of the executives. They said, okay, they said, Sasson, here you, you're telling me that uh, that calculator with a lens, how much does that calculator cost? $400, that's what it cost back then. And he says, how much is that, that, that board, you know, that, that they, these California guys were making, how much does that cost? Well, it was retailing for about $600, dollars $600, $700. So he says, for over $1,000, you can offer something that takes way worse pictures than an Instamatic loaded with 126 film does for $35. Tell me why we're listening to this. And I didn't have an answer. Mm. Other, than, other than, I don't see any reason why improvements in technology won't come along where this could be an effective, uh, effective approach. Right? I mean, you know, there was a lot of progress in digital microprocessor was starting to start it just starting to explode memory was starting to explode imagers really weren't taking off at the time there was some experimental work being done in maybe a handful of countries around the world but that was about it uh and so uh, you know it was a kind of a weak position to have and and so i was challenged uh, by the managers to say well okay when do you think this will be consumer viable for a consumer product now i had absolutely no idea how to do that how to figure what that was. But I kept being asked that question, meeting after meeting. I showed this many times throughout 1976 inside that conference rooms to different levels of management. And finally, I, I, I decided I had to come up with an answer. And so I said, since this is a completely digital project, completely digital, I thought I'll use uh, Moore's Law, which was, which was published at the time. And people were starting to use that to gauge the future of where digital might go. And I said, I called up the research laboratories, the image scientists, the research laboratories, and I said, how many pixels would I need in order to make something roughly equivalent to a consumer photography? And they said, what kind of consumer photography? And I said, the worst possible kind, I said. <laughs> uh, and, and they said, okay, 110 film. That was a film format at the time. They said, you need about a million pixels, two million if you want color. I had 10,000. They had two million. They suggested two million. So I used Moore's Law, and not knowing if it at all applied to CCD technology, which I suspect you could have an argument that it didn't, but um, uh, and, I, and I came up with a, a number of between 15 and 20 years. So that was my answer at the time. I said 15 or 20 years from now, this potentially will be a consumer product. So and roughly that would take you uh, to the mid-90s. Yeah, to the mid-90s. It turns out we, we introduced our first consumer digital camera 18 years later. Mm. Now, I got to tell you that, that for me, you know, I, I, I turned out to be in the frame reference uh, time frame that I was talking about, but I was completely, 
I was desperate for an answer, and I and I don't and I don't take any credit for for being reasonably correct in that because I had no idea what I was doing. I I was just using a generalized prediction of where things would go. I had no idea about some of the other things that were being developed, like the internet, for example, and those kinds of things, wireless communication, uh, thermal printing, and, and 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 inkjet printing for prints. I, I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff. Yeah. So, so so that was really that was really my answer to that question. Uh, and and when you tell a corporation of executives that it's going to take basically a dec- two decades to get there, maybe if you're lucky, you know they don't get that excited about it. Uh, and so uh, that's kind of where it le- we left it. I, I, I showed it throughout 1976. Uh, I filed a patent. I, I showed it to our patent department, and they thought, well, it's interesting enough to file a patent on. And so we filed a patent, received the first patent for digital camera in 1978. And, um, and, uh, and then I, I worked in digital imaging uh, my entire career at Kodak, ever since then, ever since 1974. Well, let me, I've but, worked only in digital imaging. So. We'll, 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 talk, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Before we leave that uh, 1976 time period, it's obvious and, and, and you know clear to see why people would be like, well, this doesn't make sense. Maybe 20 years from now, we'll take another look at it. But were there anybody, was there anybody that you can remember that kind of got it, that kind of saw, oh, this, this will take over film at some point. This is the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the, I mean, let me tell you something. The people at Kodak were not stupid. They mm. got it. OK. Um, the question was, how long and will it ever get there? I mean, there were questions you might not think of from questions today, but back then they were valid questions. Could could charge couple devices or any electronic solid state device ever get to the resolution and dynamic range of photographic film? Remember, if you're going to replace a technology with a new technology, you will not be successful at it if you are somehow deficient in the fundamental attribute of the original technology, that is the ability to capture high quality images. So we didn't know if CCDs could ever get to that point. Digital, for example, had a very bad reputation back then. It wasn't considered very reliable. You know, remember, digital was complicated, esoteric, expensive. Nobody did anything with it. And you're going to, you're going to replace that with photographic film, which was, been around for a hundred years and was very, very reliable. No one ever questioned when you pushed the shutter that you'd get your picture. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't George a problem was that was broken. It wasn't a problem that was broken. Nobody was asking for this. Nobody was disappointed in any way with the photographic system we had at the time. It was cheap. It was reliable. It was available to the average consumer. You needed no training to take a picture. Uh, and you could get your prints back, and they were really good prints under difficult photographic systems, and you could get them for very little money. No one had a problem with what we had. So I wasn't solving any problem for anybody. I was just offering an alternative future that uh, uh, I found intriguing. And many people did, but it was a long way away. We knew it was going to take almost a working lifetime to get there, if we could get there at all. Well, and as you mentioned, um, you know, you're, you're a digital convert. Um, you're evangelical about digital now. So as you said, throughout your career at Kodak, you continue to, to work on stuff like this. I think by 1989, you had developed a camera that's maybe roughly analogous to the SLRs that we're familiar with today, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, in between that, after that point, they allowed me to keep working on digital. I built several other cameras, not cameras like you see there. They were big racks of electronics to test out different aspects of it. And I basically kept working on different parts of the camera. I w- did a whole project in evaluation on s- forms of solid state memory, memory that would record digital information but didn't require a battery to be on, right? We looked at image compression. And so I worked with all different people at Kodak on all these different types of technologies over the next basically 10 years, more than 10 years. Uh, and... Um, it was only in 19, the last straw to fall in terms of technical challenges, as far as I was concerned, was the ability to store as much digital information you needed for, that would represent a really good image uh, in, in a portable device. Because, you know, you had, film was getting better and you needed many millions of pixels of color information to, st- to store to get close to a film picture. 
And so you required a lot of memory for that. And that was memory wasn't going that fast in terms of density. And so it was looking pretty bleak. So image compression became an issue. But image compression was sort of a, a, an art form. It was a science, but sort of an art form, because in the end, you compress an image and you decompress it and you look at the image and you say, how does it look? And so in the, in the end, it's a qualitative evaluation. And so we wanted to build a device that would get comp image uh, compression out of the research lab. So in 1986 or so, I worked with a fellow named Majid Rabani, who was one of the world's experts in image compression. He worked at Kodak. And I asked him, I said, if we were going to take image compression and really try to do a good job with it, and I want to put it in some sort of a product, what kind of image compression would I do? Because there were dozens, literally dozens of algorithms being tossed around by people around the world. And he mentioned, uh, he said, well, pretty soon the world will decide on discrete cosine transform, which is a mouthful again, but it, it represents a way of transforming an image mathematically such that when you do the image compression and then reconstruct it, you can really effectively get rid of the redundancy without losing any of the information contained in the image. So it looks like the original. Uh, now that eventually became the basis of what everybody knows today is what's called JPEG. But back then there was nobody knew if that was the answer, but he said, that's the answer you have to do. So I figured out, we figured out with a team of people, uh, we built a device called an image transceiver. And it was part of a product portfolio where Kodak was now going into electronic imaging uh, using uh, analog techniques. That was what was around in the 1980s. Sony and Canon were thinking about still video floppy as a way to uh, to do still images. Uh, and that was uh, not digital, but it was it was an interesting idea. But we thought it had to go digital. It had to be based around the computer, not around the television set. Uh, and so we built this device and uh, it turned out to work very well. It was actually, it has even a historical footnote, which you might find interesting. Yeah, please. Uh, uh, it was uh, in 19, uh, we, we launched the product in 87. And I honestly, it was the first time that we actually took some of this really cool technology that would be the basis of future digital cameras and made it available to the public. But nobody would buy this thing. It was a box about the size of a VCR. Mm. And all it did was capture one frame. We'd do this magic image compression on it, send it over a telephone line on a 9600-bit 9, bit per second modem, and then take an identical box and it would reconstruct the image at the other end and you'd view it on a television set. That's what it did. And we'd send an image over a telephone line in under a minute. That was our goal. Now, it doesn't sound very exotic, but back then it was pretty cool stuff. And but but it represented the last straw, in my opinion. So I really wanted to see if this would work, take it out of the research laboratories where all this stuff was done and put it in an actual product and see how people liked it. I didn't care if anybody bought the thing. Uh, I didn't think anybody would. I thought maybe a few people in law enforcement or or, uh, or real estate or something might do. But I, I it wasn't going to be a consumer product. Anyway, CBS News bought this and had one of these. And in 1989, Tiananmen Square happened. And um uh, uh, Tiananmen Square was a very difficult political time in, in China, and uh, because there were so many protests, the government sort of shut down all of the normal channels for getting out information and images about what was going on. And so they did. They shut down the, all these images, and uh, they had one of these, and nobody knew this thing existed. <laughs> and that's how CBS News got some of their more famous images out of China at that time. Wow. They were so excited about that that they actually did a news story about it. Wow. So they did a news story, and they came to Kodak. So we want to, we want to do a news story about this device because we're getting images out that nobody else can get out. They shut out all communication channels. And uh, you know what Kodak management said? Well, wait a second. We, we really don't want to talk about this that much because the people that we sell our film to are probably not going to be too happy that we develop something that gets around film and, and allows you to send pictures out without using film. And so they didn't, Kodak didn't want to have this story come out. Uh, and it, this shows you some of the, the problems of developing uh, an emergent technology, maybe what we would call a technological discontinuity inside an established organization that, that basically has a profit machine based on the original technology. Right. There I was believe, a conflict. I, so I, I think they didn't even start to publicize some of your work until like 2001 or so, right? Yeah, my, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to say anything about any of what I've told you today mm. uh, until until 2001. Yeah, I, I never spoke about any of this work. Um, if I ever got any query about this work, 
uh, especially the original camera. And there, there was no published papers. I wasn't, I wasn't allowed to publish papers or anything. Else. All, the only time it became public is when we filed for the patent and the patent was granted. That became a public document. And there were some queries. I remember in the late 70s getting some queries from people about this new type of camera. You know, why is Kodak developing something that doesn't use film? And I was told by our public relations department, if you get any queries, send them to us. Don't answer them. Just send them to us. And that's what I did. Well, uh, so, so they were pretty quiet about it. To, to give a little bit of credit to, to Kodak, though, you know, as I was researching this, I was uncovering some things that I had forgotten about. Like, they weren't standing still in the 90s. They, they were experimenting with things like Advantix and flash picks and, you know, eventually putting... Uh, putting out cameras that would, you know, save images to, to CD-ROM and stuff like that. So it, it's not like all throughout the 90s, as especially the Internet starts to happen, they're standing still, right? Oh, no. I, you know, I hope uh, I haven't given the impression that Kodak was somehow missing the boat here. They not at not. all. They were spending, first of all, a lot of money in R&D. And I was referencing more or less the 1980s where it was pretty quiet. In other words, they didn't really publicly talk about any of this stuff, but they were doing some very innovative work, especially mm -hmm. in the area of charge coupled devices. You know, Kodak demonstrated the first megapixel CCD imager with a color filter array on it. So it would be color images in 1986. I mean, you were the first people to do this stuff, right? We were, we were very much looking at this, um, but uh, it, first of all, wasn't ready. Uh, to, 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 to get into the consumer space technologically wasn't ready. Uh, and the second thing is, is that uh, we were still had questions about whether it ever would find, uh, you know, get good enough uh, to replace film, for example. Uh, and there was a sizable number of people, obviously, in the company that really didn't want to see it replace film. I mean, you can, you can understand that. Film is a pretty successful consumer product. In fact, one of the most successful ones ever devised by man, if you ask me. Um, so so to, to come along and enthusiastically embrace a new technology that is that can't even begin to replace the profits of what we already had, uh, you know, was, was, a, was a dubious concept. Right. But the R&D community within Kodak worked very extensively in the 1980s, kind of behind the scenes. And then in the 1990s, uh, there were many public touch points that you referenced. Uh, that they were doing. They were way ahead in image compression and color management, uh, for storing images and things like that. They were, uh, Apple came, Apple computer, when they came out with the, uh, the, 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 uh, the first uh, Apple quick take camera that was designed and built by Kodak. They came to Kodak to build that camera because we knew more about digital, building digital cameras than anybody else. They, we, we, our first, uh, our first DSLR based cameras, that was, when I say DSLR based cameras, they are cameras that used DSLR bodies built by established vendors in, this, in the early days by Nikon and then later on by Canon. Um, we would buy their cameras and then we would convert them to digital cameras and then sell them to specialized groups like the military and space in the early 1990s. A um, fellow named Jim McGarvey led that effort for Kodak. And uh, they were very successful in introducing the concept to uh, uh, in certainly government applications and then and then in photo and uh, photojournalist applications uh, the idea of a digital uh, digital camera they were expensive they were not as good quality uh, and they were very big and bulky at the time in the early 90s but they allowed a photo uh, journalist to do something he couldn't do with a film camera and that was he could see the images he took uh, more or less immediately at the site, and then he could transmit them back to his publication right away. And that was really cool. Uh, and that was worth money. And so that's why they could, they would afford to, they could afford to spend, you know, the many tens of thousands it costs for these devices in the early 1990s. But Kodak was driving that. Mm -hmm. Kodak was driving the consumer imaging. So they were very, very attuned to this. Uh, they were very, very, the R&D community was very excited about it. At this time, there were hundreds, if not a thousand people working in some aspect of digital photography at Kodak. And not just in consumer space, in commercial space, and in the health area, uh, and photo finishing. Even photo finishing was being converted to digital in the 90s. So there was a lot of work there. The, the challenge that we felt that we had, in my opinion, was how do you introduce and displace a very profitable existing technology uh, with this new stuff. I mean, if you go to a salesman and you say, sell a roll of film, that's not that hard to do. 
tell them to sell a digital camera and a photo finishing system and a computer and how it works and all that kind of stuff. That's really a lot harder. And then where's the profit? Where's the continuing revenue stream? As I was challenged many times in meetings, they, I would show them some prototype of some kind. They say, okay, I get it, but show me the money. So I, I, I want to I yeah. hit on that just a little bit because, I mean, it's, it's easy with retrospect to think of the Codex story as sort of a textbook example of, you know, disruption by technology. But from what you're saying, it, it, there's a lot more nuance to it than that. It's more like the, you know, the, the frog and the, and the pot of boiling water thing. It's not like there's a switch turned overnight and all of a sudden the market is gone. Um, it's, it's a gradual thing where there's still profits being made and, and there's, you know, it, it's still a thriving company, right? Yes. They, I mean, Kodak introduced their cameras. They had, they introduced their first point and shoot camera, I think in 1995 or so first megapixel camera in 1997 or 98, as I remember. Um, they worked on systems that would automatically charge the camera and then have a printer as part of the charger that was in the early 2000s. They were trying to make digital photography as easy as film photography, right? So they were very aggressively doing it. But the, the profits really weren't there. Uh, and so there was always a challenge management had as to where do I, where do I take my R&D investment? Do I try to get film to last a little bit longer? Because if I can keep film going at the pace it is this year, next year, if I keep one more year, they could exactly calculate how much profits they're going to get. But if I aggressively try to remove film from this and replace it with this new technology, one, we knew the profits were not nearly as high, and two, uh, we didn't really know it, you know, it was a new area. And there were a lot more competitors, by the way. One of the things that you have to remember when you're dealing with a technology-based business, one of the biggest issues is the barrier to entry. To manufacture, design and manufacture photographic film was incredibly difficult. One of the most complex consumer products ever built was photographic film. Uh, very few people managed to do it successfully, only a handful in over 100 years. And um, uh, it was uh, an art form. Uh, it was based on trade secrets, not really patents, as far as I remember. Um, you really, 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 uh, it took decades to get that perfected. And the machines had to be all custom built. So very few people could get into that business. The barrier to entry, as I expressed before, was very high. But when you get into digital imaging, the barrier to entry was much lower. And many more people could participate. And many more people that knew more about manufacturing electronic devices than Kodak did could get into this business. And so it was a real challenge to make that transition for Kodak. Well, I, I want to wrap up um, by you've made me you made me think of something again that I, I turned up in researching this, which is that um, George Eastman's original vision that allowed Kodak to become successful was this concept of, of democratizing photography. So I'm wondering, how do you feel that when, when, when you look at what's, you know, with smartphone cameras today and, you know, there's got to be more photographs being taken today than any other time in history, like. Is it almost, do you feel like it's almost George Eastman's vision just continuing, even even if Kodak is no longer as, as big a player in, in that vision? Yeah, I, I, I firmly believe, uh, it's a personal belief, that George Eastman would have loved digital photography. Because as you correctly pointed out, his idea was to take this esoteric art in the late 1800s. It was an esoteric the art that required tremendous patience and finances to take a picture and to turn it into an everyday experience to make it to make taking a picture as easy as using a pencil right that's what he used to say and what has digital photography done it not only made it easier to take pictures that is the cameras are smaller they're more versatile uh, very low light they're very they're very reliable but it also allows you to share immediately and that's really what he liked to do. I mean, he shared his images through uh, a very easy way of getting you back prints, personal prints of what you took. But think about now, you can instantly share the images the minute you take them. Now, I know people are used to that now, but quite frankly, it's changed the way we communicate with each other. I mean, it's evident from the news you see and things like that. Right. But even the everyday conversations that you have, it's turned taking pictures into a form of casual conversation rather than memorializing a particular event, right? We, we take pictures to show where we are. 
we, we casually put them up on the social media networks and broadcast to the world. Uh, sort of the power of one has been amplified tremendously in terms of personal experience. And that, I think George Eastman would have loved that uh, because that's what his whole vision was uh, about this. He struggled for decades, first to create flexible film, to make it economically viable and reliable, and then a 30-year struggle to get uh, color into film. That was what his life was about. But it was all dedicated toward getting better pictures, easier and cheaper for everybody to enjoy. Um, and I think you I can't argue that digital has done that as well. Wait, uh, just real quickly on that note, as someone that's been so influential in developing this technology, what do you think of the quality of, of digital photography in, in the age of smartphones? No, oh, I think it's fantastic. I, it's amazing. I, I, I can honestly tell you, if, if you had told me that... <laughs> You know, 30, 40 years after I was working on this, that these phones would be as small, as reliable, as good, as as, as unbelievable. The, the low light capability of these things just explores me. OK, um, it's it's remarkable. Uh, I've seen a remarkable revolution uh, in my life. And so I can tell you from personal experience and having lived to it, uh, you cannot believe the progress that will be made in one working lifetime toward things like this. Uh, it's just just really is unbelievable. Change really does happen. It seems frustrating, every, you know, on the day when you get up to, oh, this will never work. And then sooner or later, uh, it happens. I, 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 I can't tell you the number of times during that interval, probably between 1975 and 1990, even after that, but between that particular, the number of times I was told uh, why a digital camera would never be that small and never be that big and never be that cheap and never be that reliability. I can't count the number of times I was told that by experts about why different aspects would just, they're just not likely to ever occur. Mm -hmm. right? uh, and yet now uh, it's, it's incredible to see. So I try to get that across to young people that uh, uh, don't, don't, don't lose your enthusiasm about your idea. You have no idea where the inventions are going to come that are going to solve the problems that you're seeing today. Uh, well, Steve Sasson, um, thank you for uh, coming on the show and, and telling us that whole story and uh, giving us the context of, like you said, something that we sort of increasingly take for granted, but um, is, is really so, so fascinating to be almost a miracle in, in, of the modern age. Uh, yes, it, it is a miracle of the modern age. And thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in your program. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, Please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes. Because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.